Welcome to the devious case of Mark Jensen, who was sentenced after poisoning his wife. Or did he really? I'm going to go through whether he's guilty or not guilty. In this ongoing story, I'll narrate the entire events. If you do end up liking this video, please subscribe. Now, my videos will always be free, but if you do want to help support the channel, PayPal and Cash App donation links are in the description. Now, researchers found that the most common reasons why people divorce are a lack of commitment, too much arguing, infidelity, marrying too young, unrealistic expectations, lack of equality in the relationship, a lack of preparation for marriage, and finally, abuse. It appears with Julie and Mark, all these reasons in their marriage apply. See, Julie and Mark seem like the perfect couple. They had everything. They'd been married for 14 years, which is a very good innings if you ask me. They had two sons. They lived in a very nice house. Their relationship seemed healthy. They were always outside, always embarking on an adventure as a family. Even their neighbours said that they were always laughing, always having fun, and it was amazing to watch them. But gradually, their marriage started to unravel. See, I have realised in life, nothing is ever what it seems. When I take a look at Mark and Julie as a couple, I can see the issues immediately. I'm going to venture a guess. I do like to give my own personal opinion, but my guess is that they got bored of each other at different times, but more on that later. See, Mark had a history of being a stockbroker. When you're a stockbroker in the 1990s, you got everything. You got money, you got recognition, you got fame, fame within the city that you're in, so to speak, drugs, alcohol, partying. You're a millionaire. You can have anything you want. And Mark wanted Julie to be more sexually experimental. Mark did ask Julie, to go to strip clubs with him, go to bars, clubs, get drunk, maybe even do drugs. Mark wanted to spice things up. Mark lived in a world, or he used to live in a world, where his peers, whether married or not, they were partying excessively, because they could. Again, if you're a millionaire, in the 90s, you're gonna party like it's 1999. Mark wanted to bring this lifestyle home, and it appeared Julie wasn't having any of it. Julie did at times actually contemplate a divorce, but she told her neighbour if I divorce him, Mark would kill me. Now it's unclear what she meant by this, but the defence did use it against Mark. But sometimes when you use metaphors in our speech, it's of course not literal. If you're young and you say, hey, I gotta be home, otherwise my mum would kill me, well that's obviously not a literal statement. But it did get me thinking, if this was true, then how did Mark actually treat her? If Julie felt her life was in danger, then was Mark physically abusive? I mean, a divorce these days is as frequent as a Taco Bell sandwich sending you straight to the bathroom. But perhaps this was an indication into the dark and unenvious world of what life is really like for the upper class. See, looking in, everything seems rosy, but sometimes too much of a good thing can be disastrous. So then, on December 3rd, 1998, 40-year-old Julie Jensen was discovered dead in her bed by her husband Mark. In the early hours of the investigation, police said suicide was a likely cause of death. In fact, in some conspiracy theories, it is believed that the first hour of any event is the closest you'll ever get to the truth. The DA was at the house on the 3rd of December and he felt very differently. The DA said it didn't look right. And this is interesting. See, when you're a police officer or when you're a lawyer and you go to the actual crime, the site of the crime, your experiences, the energy you feel, uh, the way you process the events and the information in your head, you can kind of get a feeling of what happened. It's experience, right? We can, we, 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 as human beings, we can use this in any situation. And at that time, the DA wasn't sure about Mark's explanation of this being a suicide. Now, it was reported that during her funeral, Mark was standing near the casket, but he was laughing and he was joking as if he was at some cocktail party. And when the autopsy came in, there was no evidence of foul play. However, what Mark and the authorities were to find after would change the course of this case forever. And by the way, if you have not subscribed yet, please do. I need to get to 100k ASAP so I can tell my mum that her son is no longer a fraud. So let me summarise all this for you. Mark and Julie were married, but their marriage becomes stale. That's fine, it happens. 
Now, some years prior to her death, she had an affair. It seems at some point, Mark forgave her. Maybe he didn't. We don't really know for sure. And he moved on. But can you really move on from that? And it makes you wonder, why did she cheat on him in the first place? In many ways, if your partner cheats on you, as much as it hurts, there could be some weight off your shoulders. When you're over the pain and when you're thinking clearly, you may feel compelled to go and have your own fun that you've sacrificed for marriage. Do you know what I mean? You might think, all right, I forgive her, but let me go have my own fun now. She had hers, I want mine. There's no excusing what she did, but it seems to me that she wasn't getting the attention she wanted and she was very much neglected by Mark. Now, what the police actually discovered was a letter that she wrote confirming that her husband might kill her. But before I show you the letter, we need to understand Julie's mental situation. So here's Dr. Richard Borman during the trial. She uh, denied smoking, admitted to occasional alcohol, and uh, told me that her mom had had alcohol problems, and so she was careful about the alcohol consumption. Okay, are you, are, and I'm still not clear. Is she reporting some feelings of some depression at the time and reporting that she'd had depression with treatment with Prozac in the past, or is she uh, only talking about history at that point? Well, she was talking about some PMS sim symptoms, and sometimes that can be bloating and cramping and such, but that can be emotional problems. And then she did mention some uh, being tired, fatigue, and so I was concerned that there may be some depression there. And, um, and so in, in terms of what your feelings were as to whether she was experiencing any depression in September, September 21 of 1998, did you feel she was? Um, I thought she could be uh, somewhat depressed. Okay. The doctor confirmed that Julie was suffering from some form of depression. The doctor went on to confirm that depression ran in Julie's family. And this was the narrative that the defense was hoping would stick. In fact, the doctor did mention that Julie's mother did have alcohol issues. But you can decide for yourselves if Julie really was depressed. Yep. Um, it says uh, she was miserable. Depressed. Well, let me let me write these down. She reported that she was miserable. Yes. Depressed. Uh, yes. Some of this may have been my paraphrasing, but uh, that was uh, obvious from our contact and discussion. She discussed or described marital problems. Marital problems. Marital problems. And she did allude to um, an affair that she'd had in the past and felt that Mark had never really forgiven her for that. What neither Mark nor the investigators knew was that Julie had left her own testimonial about what was going on in her house. Before she died, she actually gave an envelope to her neighbors and said, if anything happens, give this to the police. After her death, the neighbors gave the police the sealed envelope and inside it, was a letter written by Julie. Now, here is the letter. This is the official letter that she wrote. First of all, it says Ron Cosman or Detective Ratzenberg. It's interesting how the letter is directed to the police, uh, police officers specifically, sorry. And this is because Julie had actually complained to the police previously about uh, concerns in her marriage, but because the police had no evidence, they didn't pursue Mark any further but she obviously remembered the detective's names. So the letter said, I took this picture and I am writing this on Saturday, November the 21st, 1998 at 7am. This list was in my husband's business daily planner. Not meant for me to see. I don't know what it means, but if anything happens to me, he would be my first suspect. Our relationship has deteriorated to the polite superficial. When she says list, she's referring to a list that she found Mark made. It was like a shopping list that included poisons and all this other stuff. But I'll get to that in a second. I know he's never forgiven me for the brief affair I had with that creep years ago. Mark lives for work and the kids. He's an avid surfer of the internet. Anyway, I do not smoke or drink. My mother was an alcoholic, so I limit my drinking to one or two a week. Mark wants me to drink more. And this ties into what I said, Mark wanted to spice things up. Mark wants me to drink more with him in the evenings. I don't. I would never take my life because of my kids. They are everything to me. I regularly take Tylenol, 
and multivitamins, occasionally take OTC stuff for colds, I think that says Zantac, or Imodium, have one prescription for migraine tablets which Mark uses more than I. I pray I'm wrong and nothing happens, but I am suspicious of Mark's suspicious behaviours, fear for my early demise. However, I will not leave, and I presume that's the kid's name, my life's greatest love, accomplishment and wish, my 3Ds. And the shopping list that she mentioned was written by Mark and it included a list of items such as poisons, syringes, etc. And the investigators viewed the contents of the envelope, this letter, and they saw it as key evidence as Julie's last will and testament. Mark himself had some secrets of his own. He had been having an affair with a married co-worker, Kelly Labont, and professed his love to her in emails that were found on his computer. Now this may not be surprising, but this could be a motivation for murder. If you take his affair and the letter you just read, the prosecution have ammunition, which if dictated in the correct way, they could convict Mark. They could argue, hey, he wanted to get her out of the way because he's having an affair. Now, there were months of legal wrangling, but eventually, investigators were dealt a crushing blow. In 2002, the letter was ruled inadmissible. This is because in the US, the accused always has the right to face the accuser. And that's interesting. In other words, if you are accused of a crime, you have the right to face your accuser. Like, you know, defendant, plaintiff, all that stuff in court. But because Julie was no longer alive, Mark could not face her, which is his right. Therefore, that letter was inadmissible. The DA did say he can't confront her because he killed her, which is actually a very good point, to be fair. Even Julie Jensen's four brothers were devastated. They went on to say, we should fight to get the letter admitted, because that was Julie's voice. Now, in 2007, after years of legal disputes, which made their way to the Wisconsin Supreme Court, Julie Jensen's letter was finally ruled admissible and a trial date was set. Now, during the trial, Mark was accused of murder in the first degree. The trial itself did take place nine years after his wife's death and it was shown live on cable television and the internet. The Attorney General, Bob Jamboy, argued that the man poisoned his wife with antifreeze and then suffocated her so he could start a new life with his mistress. Kelly Labont moved into the Jensen household shortly after Julie's death and she and Mark married in 2002, which, with all due respect, Mr. Jensen, rookie move, rookie move. That in it, that's the height of stupidity. Imagine this, your wife dies uh, in sus suspicious circumstances, your mistress moves in with you in the very house that your ha wife lived in, and then you marry her. What a rookie move. Now, the suffocation argument was a shift in the case that came after. So the DA had the letter as its smoking gun. Well, it wasn't really a smoking gun, but it was a key piece of evidence. But then the suffocation. This was amplified in court when a man by the name of Aaron Dillard, who was an informant, Aaron used to be in jail when, when Mark was in jail, Aaron was his uh, roommate, if that's even the right word. Aaron decided to come forward and he made a deal. He will tell the prosecution everything Mark told him in jail, you know, for time off his own sentence. He asked you, is there anybody around this? Yeah. And what'd you say to him? I said the letter is only if they don't cooperate what Kluge said. If they don't cooperate it, then you're fine. But if they cooperate it, you're fucked. Well, t tell me about that. Um, he was laughing that how could he said you came in and put the bottle of Benadryl on the table and you know said he, he poisoned his wife with Benadryl and antifreeze and things along that sort and he was kind of laughing about well if she if I gave her that much Benadryl and I mix it with antifreeze she'd be full of Benadryl that kind of thing. Okay, so he was pretty dismissive of my theory Absolutely. from the forfeiture hearing. Yeah, that you guys lost all the transcripts or all the paperwork from the toxicology reports and all that stuff and then he was making comments about that I said well then if that's true then you can just make your lawyer order new blood tests and have your own blood work done and if they can't produce the blood samples that should be a pretty decent way out of it well I mean he was uh, telling me that basically his wife was crazy that she was insane and that she or she would self-medicate herself things like that things did he ever say anything to you about Julie that would 
cause you to think that he in any way regretted her death? No. Did he ever tell you that he missed Julie? Never. Tell the jury what Mr. Jensen told you about what he did. Um, Mark Jensen said that they, this is the, the conversation out of his mouth for what happened to that. Um, he said that uh, they went to the doctor because she was really depressed and things like that. And that when he went to the doctor, they gave her Paxil. And then they came home, she took the medication. And uh, at that point is when she said that, or he said that she got loopy because she took Benadryl. Uh, Paxil, and then I think it was the Librium at that time. And that she got real loopy and this and that, and she wanted to lay down. She just was real tired, so he gave her juice to drink, and that was when he told me at that point that it was mixed with the antifreeze. As the trial went on, defense attorney Craig Albee quickly attacked Dillard's testimony and forced him to admit that he is a con man. And as you can see from the video, Aaron didn't even really care to be honest. I mean, he did care. He wanted time off his own sentence, but Aaron had no problem in the way he was being depicted. Witness after witness came forward to talk about Julie Jensen's character. And then the neighbor, Ted Watt, took the stand. Ted told the jury that Jensen believed her husband was trying to kill her. Ted actually testified that she had seen him on poison sites on the internet. Julie believed that she thought her husband was trying to make her look crazy to take her kids. And as I mentioned previously, it was here when she saw this, that she went to the police and complained, but they did nothing about it. See, Julie had actually filed for divorce years earlier, but Julie's brother Paul testified in court that Mark told Julie she would never ever see their sons again if she went through with it. This again ties into the, he would kill me if I left. Now, of course, when the uh, lawyers made their opening statements, Craig Alby, the defense attorney, the attorney for Mark, told the jury that facts will prove that Mark Jensen did not kill his wife. Depression and despair caused Julie to take her own life. And this was the main uh, case or argument from the defense saying Mark didn't do this. Julie was depressed and she did this herself. The defense attorney continued to tell the jury that Julie framed Mark by leaving the letter, making it look like he harmed her because her depression and her despair and her anger and her delusional thinking caused her to point the finger at Mark. But ultimately, the jury did not believe that Julie committed suicide. The prosecution's case ran five weeks and the defense just took five days. Mark did not take the stand in his defense. The jury themselves took four days to deliberate and before a packed courtroom, the foreman read a verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant, Mark D. Jensen, guilty of intentional homicide of the first degree as charged in the information. So unless there is some reason why sentence should not now be pronounced, I'll ask that you stand for sentence, please. Mr. Jensen, it is the sentence of the court that your custody be committed to the Department of Corrections for confinement in the Wisconsin State Prisons without possibility of parole for the remainder of your life. You may be seated. So of course, Mark appealed his decision. And as the years have gone on, he's been going through more legal wranglings. But on May 23rd, 2022, a new trial date has been set for Mark. This time, the voicemail that Julie left for the police, you know, the one I mentioned earlier about her complaining, will not be admissible. And they are discussing whether her letter will be allowed admissible. Again, this all goes back to the Sixth Amendment where the accused has the right to face the accuser. So now we come to my own thoughts and conclusion. And that's why at the beginning, I gave the reasons why people get married. And I mentioned they got bored of each other. And this is the problem of individualism. We live in a world where Corporations and slogans define our self-worth. Pepsi, live life to the max. L'Oreal, because you're worth it. When in reality, the very people that we need, the very people who are supposed to make us feel great are the ones we love in the first place. Just take marriage, for example. You are saying, in a marriage, you are saying, Bob, Kathy, or dare I say Karen, whatever your name is, I want to spend the rest of my life with you. And let's take my life, for example. I love football, S soccer, but of course I call it football. I love video games. I love making YouTube videos. I like hanging out with my friends. I love music. But some of that would need to be sacrificed if I were to get married. See, freedom 
is when you're able to do whatever you want and nobody asks you a question. But if you're willing to sacrifice some of your freedom, and I don't mean that in a bad way, I'm saying that you have less time, your time is less to yourself when you're in a relationship. You make that decision because you feel that person is worth it. And that's what Mark and Julie did until they realized he wasn't worth it. Hence the affairs they were both having. But in this case, whether you're Mark or whether you're Julie or whether you're anyone, if you don't want it, walk away. How many times have I made videos? How many times have you heard me say, if you don't want to be in this marriage, get lost. But what ends up happening? One of them ends up dying. Now it's very plausible that Mark was framed. I don't know if you guys have seen the film Gone Girl. It is plausible. She probably hated him. She probably resented him. She obviously didn't like the way he treated her. So she writes a letter. I mean, Mark could have looked at chemicals and stuff to fix stuff around the house. But of course, as I said earlier, if you dictate a story in a certain way, then you can get people to think all sorts. And it seems to me that the key point of evidence was that letter. But I don't know if Mark did it and generally I, I don't even care. For me, the moral here is, if you didn't want her Mark, why would you do this? If we assume he did it, why this? And to Julie, if hypothetically, if she did frame him, you couldn't walk away. So it does get me to think, You, as I said earlier, you guys have heard me say this over and over again. It gets me to think maybe it's an instinctive thing. Maybe it's the, the attachment that you have, the routine that you've become accustomed to 14 years. Maybe it's just a near impossible task to walk away. But then it isn't. How many divorces do we see every day? Like I said, it's as frequent as going to the bathroom after you've had a couple Taco Bells. So I don't know. I don't know why people don't walk away. I don't know why Mark felt the need to kill her if he did. And I guess his trial next year will determine that. And the final word I'll say is this. Some of you might read this or, or listen to this, sorry, and say he's guilty. Stop defending him. I'm not defending Mark. I'm just, I'm just pontificating ideas. But we have to respect the decision. So if Mark is guilty right now, he's guilty. He should have walked away. But if Mark next year, uh, walked away from his wife, that is. But if next year... Mark is, uh, we're in 2021 right now. So if next year in 2022, Mark is found not guilty, then we have to, he's gone through the process and we have to respect the decision. And if he's not guilty, then my or oh my Julie, you've definitely run a number on him. Thank you for watching.